built by Sir Francis Dashwood, West Wickham Manor is set in a beautiful park, a perfect setting for a man who enjoys the good life. Its colonnaded west front, however, is unusual for a climate like Buckinghamshire in England. It recalls the moments its owner spent lazing in the loggia of an Italian palazzo. It also reflects in architecture the society of a time when young men of privilege went in passionate pursuit of life as a complete gentleman. The idea of a complete gentleman developed in ancient Greece five centuries before the Christ event. They believed a man must be respected, not as the instrument of an omnipotent overlord, but for his own sake. Its citizens, while trying every form of action, tempered it with the maxim of nothing in excess. A good man was considered truly noble in hands and feet and mind, fashioned full square without blemish. Public and private honour was intimately related, and if a man received a reward for his success, it was not only a personal reward, it was an obligation he owed his city. This ideal was both white and generous. Pericles, who was a statesman, orator and general at Athens during the Golden Age, said, each single one of our citizens in all the manifold aspects of life is able to show himself the rightful lord and owner of his person, and to do this, moreover, with exceptional grace and versatility. During the 15th century at Florence in Italy, this ideal achieved finely balanced attitudes. A Florentine gentleman also wanted something beyond himself, whether in truth or beauty. He set small store by his own gratification, equating honour with the greater good. A true Renaissance man was a complete gentleman whose pursuit of knowledge was only exceeded by his desire for more. This is an ideal young English nobles discovered three centuries later during their grand tour of Europe and it helped inspire them to achieve. Throughout the 18th century and first 30 years of the 19th century, young men of fashion and style spent up to five years travelling through France and Italy, returning home via Switzerland, Germany, Austria and the Netherlands. All roads led to Rome and the main aim was to see the sights and set foot on classical ground. Grand tourists went to Italy because visits to Greece were the exception due to a dangerous political situation. The classical heritage of Rome, for all intents and purposes, was civilization. Parents sent their son away for years in the care of a tutor or trusted family friend who safeguarded his morals, oversaw his studies and looked after the practicalities of his travel and accommodation, including ensuring that there were no bedbugs. Pompeo Bertoni, 1708 to 1787, painted Grand Tourist grandly. Colonel Honourable William Gordon cut a dashing figure in plaid, standing in front of the Colosseum and next to a statue of the personification of Rome, Roma herself. In Italy, there were famous personalities to meet, the opera and Catholic processions to see. There was also a hope of gaining in health, enjoying entirely different food and viewing natural phenomena, such as the waterfall at Tivoli or Vesuvius blowing off steam. Many archaeological digs were underway and treasures from antiquity coming up for sale and returning grand tourists arrived home with bags bulging. The third Earl of Burlington, Richard Boyle, returned to England in 1715, just in time for his 21st birthday. He brought with him artist and designer William Kent, whom he'd met on his travels, and 878 pieces of luggage containing numerous treasures. He was only one of the new rulers of taste who sought that moment of perfection as provided by the classical style. They built Chiswick House to entertain Burlington's friends, its form inspired by the work of Italy's 16th century architectural genius Andrea Palladio. Palladio had written The Finest Guide to Rome 
they had used on their travels. Published in 1554, La Antiqueta de Roma helped Grand Tourists view the ruins of Rome through Palladio's eyes. This is one reason that he exerted a powerful influence on the course of Western architectural history, especially for complete gentlemen in pursuit of the perfect house. They included Thomas Jefferson before he became American president and built his Palladian-inspired house, Monticello. Painted overlooking the Arno by French artist Francois Xavier Febre, Joseph Allen Smith became the first American grand tourist to travel to Greece when the political situation improved. He included the Aegean in his tour of 1793 to 1807, travelling as a representative of the world's first republic. William Kent was an originator of the English landscape garden style. He provided temples, cascades, grottos and a Palladian bridge over gently flowing water. By broadening their sensibilities, young gentlemen came to appreciate buildings not merely as architecture, but for the thoughts and feelings they inspired. At Stourhead in the garden, the classical buildings by the lake were a reminder for banker owner Henry Hall of his wonderful years spent in Italy. Sir Francis Dashwood founded the Society of Dilettanti in 1734 at London for men who had completed their grand tour of Europe. Over the course of the century they sponsored archaeological expeditions, collections of antiques and art and advanced the study of classical art, architecture, music and science. The popular dining club met in Italy and at home, combining ribald revelry, wit and complete irreverence with a serious study of antiquity. Their interests and concerns became the measure of a man of refined taste and style, and Dashwood's Italian-style villa at West Wickham Park became the perfect temple to taste, worthy of a man who had fashioned and styled himself as a complete gentleman. The death knell of the Ancien Régime at France during the Revolution the rise in status of the bourgeoisie during the Industrial Revolution meant a great change in the status of gentlemen over the next 100 years. During the final years of the 19th century, sartorial splendour became one way to distinguish a true gentleman, when England's prince-in-waiting Edward led fashionable society. Later, as Edward VII, he encouraged the use of lounge suits on social occasions. The cut was important, the trousers narrow, and this style of dress did not relax until it also began to include sporting clothes. He brought about the notion that a gentleman should look as if he had bought his clothes with intelligence, put them on with care, and then forgotten all about them. His public life and private life were poles apart, so as a role model, he left a great deal to be desired. By the 1920s and 30s, English chic had become an international style, with American film stars like Cary Grant leading the way. It appeared far more relaxed and comfortable with Fred Astaire, whose graceful nonchalance was not at odds with his Savile Row London tailored suits. He epitomised elegance in his top hat, tails and cane, providing a new role model for how a gentleman should look and behave. And on top of all that, he could dance. It is the individual character of a gentleman that is the inducement to great actions and the spur to great achievements in any age. Today, a complete gentleman comes in many guises from all walks of life and all backgrounds. One thing that is certain is that he is at the cutting edge of 21st century enlightenment. Like his ancient Greek counterpart, he promotes the emergence of new ideas. He encourages the raising of positive voices to benefit marginalized sections of society. And he brings it about by giving time, effort, even money to ensure practical action.